Hey, aloha, and welcome to Stan Energy Man here at Think Tech Hawaii, where it's uh, another beautiful Friday, a little windy today here in Hawaii. I'm Stan Osterman from the Hawaii Center for Advanced Transportation Technologies, and uh, we're here today to talk again about uh, one of my favorite subjects, which is hydrogen. And uh, we're getting caught up with a good friend um, that I've met at several conferences, uh, Department of Energy conferences that I attended and fuel cell conferences in California. Um, Mr. Steve Jones from uh, ITM Power. And um, he uh, talks a little funny, but he lives in California. Um, and he doesn't have a California accent. He's still got his UK accent. And uh, he's going to kind of get us up to speed on what's been going on in Europe, um, across the continent with uh, clean energy and specifically, probably more specifically, hydrogen. Um, and then also what's going on in California, because their company does a lot of work worldwide. And so one of the companies I keep looking at to make sure I have my finger on the pulse of, of what's happening now. So, Steve, thanks for joining us today. I appreciate you uh, chiming in there from California. And um, Yeah, no problem. Thanks, Dan. Good to be on again. Yeah. So give everybody, uh, you know, we have some folks that probably haven't uh, seen you before or know your background. Why don't you give us an idea of, uh, give the viewers an idea of uh, what your background is and how you got into what you're doing at ITM. Sure, yeah, thanks. So, um, originally I started as a material scientist at, at university in the UK, and um, one of my final year assignments was looking at purification uh, of hydrogen and the technology associated with that. Um, and then, so that got me into the hydrogen space, and um, relatively soon after university, I decided that that was what I wanted to do, and, and um and so I've been working in the hydrogen space uh, most of the time ever since. Um, so currently with ITM Power, I've been with ITM Power for 13, 14 years now. Um, started in the UK um, and then for the last four and a half years, I've been out here in California, uh, heading up the US subsidiary ITM Power Inc. Um, looking at uh, electrolysis solutions and hydrogen refueling mainly. Uh, but also crossing over into some uh, hydrogen energy storage applications as well. That's great. So, you know, one of the things that attracted me to uh, looking at your company was all the things that you're involved in over on the European continent. And, um, you know, as I look at all of the, the uh, industry publications and, and newsletters that I get, um, there's a lot going on the, around the world. In fact, um, I was at a meeting this week um, with some Arizona State University folks and some um, Julie Wrigley Foundation folks looking at funding hydrogen projects. And um, Paul Pontio, the chief uh, technology officer at Blue Planet, made the statement that he's been doing this kind of stuff probably about as long as you have, you know, 14, 15 years. And he says, this is the year that hydrogen's really going to take off internationally. And I, I agree with him. Would you agree with that statement? And then could you give us an idea of what's going on in Europe? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, I mean, first off, yes, I think that. Um, I agree with that. You know, this this year and the coming uh, years after are really going to be when we start to see a step change in, in what's going on with hydrogen. Uh, having been involved for so many years in the industry, you know, as with a lot of these emerging technologies, um, they can take a little while to find their feet. But now, you know, you have real strategic uh, commercial projects that are happening around the world. And, um, you know, we're really starting to see that gather pace. So, for example, um, ITM is currently in the process of deploying the world's largest pen electrolyzer system. Um, and the customer in that, uh, in that project is Shell. And Shell are using that hydrogen system uh, in their uh, refinery in Germany. And, um, you know, that's really a flagship project. Uh, it's only 10 megawatts, but that 10 megawatts can grow very, very rapidly in that refinery industry. Um, and, you know, another couple of examples in Europe, um, France, um, H2B and uh, GE are putting together projects that will see hundreds of megawatts of electrolysis being deployed in France. Um, uh, I think it's 700 megawatt projects that they're ideally targeting. Uh, and likewise, in Germany, some of the big utility companies have just announced that they're looking at the first 100 megawatt electrolysis project to provide uh, grid scale energy storage for the German energy market. Um, so, that, you know, when we've moved from 
one, two, five megawatt demonstration plants up to this 100 megawatt commercial scale now, you know, that's starting to get companies like ITM involved to drive costs down, increase um, production capacities, um, and, you know, we'll start to see a real, uh, a real uptick in the market, in my opinion. So, so is ITM more of an integrator or is it, do you guys manufacture equipment as well? And, you know, how, how, do you, how would you describe ITM as a company? Yeah, so ITM primarily is a manufacturer of, of PEM electrolyzers. That's okay. our core competency. That's where our, our, our IP and know-how surrounds. And we build full um, uh, electrolysis products. Um, you know, we don't just do the stack. We'll package it in a full solution. So we go everything from electricity and water in right the way through to fuel cell grade hydrogen on the back end. Um, but because of the nature of our industry, we have to get involved both upstream and downstream of that electrolyzer. So whether it be power conditioning or um, energy balancing on the front end, um, or whether it be compression, storage, dispensing, purification, gas injection plants on the back end in the, um, you know, on the hydrogen use case side, uh, we get involved in both. So we can be both an integrator and a manufacturer in some certain circumstances. In other circumstances, we'll provide the electrolysis function to somebody else that's doing the rest of the project. Okay. So would you say that in Europe, the, um, the electric utilities in Europe um, have kind of uh, at least recognized the fact that um, your electrolyzers are a good grid stability tool in terms of a... a um, adjustable load and when they need to curtail yeah. power they can they can put it into that and then they actually have a product coming out that's not just a uh, a grounded you know dummy load or anything they're actually getting a product of hydrogen out of your electrolysis yeah very much so so the, the power to gas hydrogen energy component uh initiated in germany and there's a uh, uh you know there's there's um double digits I think nearly 30 something projects now that are looking at it in various ways. And, um, you know, the German utilities are really starting to see the benefit of hydrogen. And, and I think it comes through analyzing the energy market and what the benefits and limitations of different storage technologies are. And then, you know, every, every uh, reputable um, uh, study that's looked at large scale, you know, national scale um, energy. Um, and energy storage has concluded the same thing in that if you want to go for real what they call deep decarbonization, you know, 50 to 100 percent renewable, hydrogen has to play a role in some capacity because it, it's the only technology that spans electricity and gas as the two primary energy vectors. And it's the only technology that can scale to large, large storage duration and large volume economically so you know batteries and other technologies are very good at what they do for, you know short-term right. energy storage but for long term really you know hydrogen is the only way to go and the germans and the, and the rest of the europe is really latching onto that that's that's great i mean i i, I know that hawaii is not there yet and and i hear that uh, a lot of the mainland utilities are looking to hawaii to kind of set the example um, because we've already established a hundred percent renewable portfolio standard for our grid by 2045 and there, everybody's looking at Hawaiian Electric to kind of show how to do it. But our, our, our grid's only like a gigawatt. I mean, it's, it's not a really huge, huge grid. But um, I know that Europe's way ahead. One question I did have, though, you know, we have electric utilities, but we also have natural gas utilities um, for the same reason. They, they move gas around through pipelines all over or um, between cities and towns and things like that. So they're publicly regulated monopolies. I would assume that it's similar in Europe that you have the gas companies are also regulated. Is there now becoming a more of a um, relationship between the electric utility and the gas utility as you say, you know, you're doing power to gas and how you move it around is, how's, how's that relationship developing or is it still pretty separate? Yeah, it, it's much more integrated these days. I think in Europe, um, different to uh, the US, a lot of the energy companies are vertically integrated. So you have the gas side of the house and the electric side of the house I see. in the same organization, which obviously helps. Um, but there are still areas where, where that isn't the case. And I think what's happening now is that as the electricity side of the house tries to figure out, well, you know, how are we going to store all of this energy? 
uh, to meet our goals, they're starting to look at the benefits of power to gas and, and the fact that the gas grid is such a huge uh, asset and store of energy that's already built and paid for and under the ground. And, um, and then the gas side of the house are, are trying to figure out how they're going to decarbonize their network. And really, you know, biogas, bio-based gases and hydrogen are really the only two games in town. And so, um, you know, as utilities start to go further down that road, I think the logical conclusion is that they, that they finally come to is that they, you know, they kind of need each other. And this, this concept of sector export, we call it ITM, is, is shifting energy between the electricity and the gas sector, I think is very important. Yeah, that's interesting. I'm, I'm, we're not vertically integrated as they are, and two separate companies and under two separate corporations. In fact, uh, my understanding is that our gas company is actually, uh, their parent corporation is in New Zealand or Australia someplace. So it's like we're even international on our gas company and Hawaiian mm. Electric is, uh, you know, associated with mainland, you know, large institutions. So um, that, that, that probably makes things a lot easier when you're part of one big corporation and you can have two divisions, one for electric utility and one for gas and get them, get them working together. I think we're going to be a little challenged there. So I'll have to start thinking some more on how we do that. But, um, you know, where does most of your renewable electricity come from? Is it north, north wind, north sea wind, or is it, do you have a lot of PV going in or, you know, because those two are both the intermittent ones, which drive the, a lot of the storage requirements. Um, can you kind of give us a picture of, you know, how much electricity is nuclear, how much of it's intermittent renewable, how much of it's um, like hydroelectric sure. or pretty some other way? Yeah, so obviously it depends where you are. Um, obviously in California, most of it is solar with some wind. Uh, in Europe, there's more wind energy available, uh, you know, from the north of Germany, for example, or North Sea, uh, you know, Scotland region in the UK. Um, but the, um, I think the, the good thing about PEM electrolysis is that it's kind of agnostic. It doesn't care where, where the energy comes from, and it's very flexible. So um, you have, you know, different wind and solar resources coming onto a grid, and you can strategically place the electrolyzers where the kind of hotspots or the pinch points are in the, in the electricity network. Um, and use them essentially as a dump load to mop up the, um, the excess energy, which would otherwise be causing um, grid problems, and, and turn it into hydrogen, and then use that hydrogen uh, at a later date, either for vehicle fuel or, or primary energy or heat or, you know, whatever you want to do with it. Um, so, you know, I think areas like France obviously have a lot of nuclear base load. Um, and so when renewable energies in France are trying to come onto the grid, the nuclear base load is already there, and it has a, you know, it has a problem turning turning down, and so um, storage of energy is very important in France, and hence the reason that these hundred megawatt grid scale energy storage projects are coming online. You know, for example, in Germany, there's a big mismatch between north and south, and the connection between north and south from an electrical grid point of view isn't isn't great, and so they want to try and leverage the gas network to to move that energy around. Um, so, you know, I think it's, it's fairly geographically dependent, but I think the good thing about hydrogen energy storage is that it is so flexible and you can use it in, in, uh, in almost a, a any source. Yeah, we don't, have, we don't have nuclear power here in Hawaii. Um, and so it's kind of, did I understand you right, that actually when, when you have a nuclear power plant in play, they're not quite as flexible in adjusting their output, so they can actually... Um, push some of their output to an electrolyzer rather than try and tune the, tune the power plant. They just take any excess and push it to an electrolyzer. Did I understand that right? Yeah, yeah, very much so. Nu nuclear energy is, is very inflexible. You know, it's base load plant. It does not like to be turned on and off. You know, they, it takes days to come up, and up, up, you know, online and offline. So really it's base load steady state plant. So if you have a bunch of renewables that are kind of cutting in and out, at different levels, um, you know that that's not the ideal partnership with a with a nuclear plant. So having these flexible storage loads, um, you know, really really helps uh, manage a grid like that. All right. Okay, Steve. We're going to take a quick break here, and uh, we'll be back in sixty seconds, and then maybe we can transition to the continental U.S. and talk about what's going on in your neighborhood there.
Aloha, I'm Wendy Lowe, and I'm coming to you every other Tuesday at 2 o'clock, live from Think Tech Hawaii. And on our show, we talk about taking your health back. And what does that mean? It means mind, body, and soul. Anything you can do that makes your body healthier and happier is what we're going to be talking about. Whether it's spiritual health, mental health, fascia health, beautiful smile health, whatever it means, let's take healthy back. Aloha. Hey, aloha. My name is Andrew Lanning. I'm the host of Security Matters Hawaii, airing every Wednesday here on Think Tech Hawaii, live from the studios. I'll bring you guests. I'll bring you information about the things in security that matter to keeping you safe, your coworkers safe, your family safe, to keep our community safe. Uh, we want to teach you about those things in our industry that, you know, may be a little outside of your experience. So please join me because security matters. Aloha. Hey, welcome back to Stan the Energy Man on my lunch hour. We're talking to Stephen Jones from ITM Power, a United Kingdom-based company that has offices in California, actually has a corporation in California that's helping California get their um, hydrogen stations set up for their uh, transportation sector. And that's probably a good place to start the transition, uh, Stephen, is um, transportation. Because, uh, again, even California, uh, I don't think their grid's catching up to where Europe's at and using uh, hydrogen effectively on their grid um, and a lot of their a lot of their hydrogen is steam reformed there uh, by by california law um, 70 percent of the hydrogen that's produced can be produced through steam reformation off of natural gas and that's by far a cheaper way to make it than electrolysis so we're still breaking the code over there can you can you talk about the transportation uh, side of europe you know what's coming out online over there and also maybe how it's integrating and then maybe help us with, with what's going on in California. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, so transportation is obviously a big, a big topic uh, within hydrogen. You know, it's the, it's the thing that grabs the headlines with the, you know, the new cool cars that are coming out and buses and things like that. And you have all of the OEMs uh, touting their new hydrogen vehicles, um, buses, uh, you know, Toyotas moving into the world of trucking. Um, Hyundai is, is, is saying that they're going to have thousands and thousands of fuel cell buses and trucks on the roads. Um, and we're starting to see big transportation schemes pop up. So, um, uh, you know, in the, in the UK, for example, uh, we're building a network of stations out there to um, support uh, the emerging hydrogen fuel cell fleet. Uh, things like the Metropolitan Police Force has shown interest in, in having a fleet of 200 Toyota Mirais uh, to, drive, to drive the policemen uh, around the London area. Um, and, you know, just the other day, uh, there was an announcement of um, a new uh, round of funding to put a load more buses and vehicles, passenger vehicles, on the road in the UK. Um, Europe is looking at combined uh, procurement. So looking at, you know, how can we get the costs of 100 buses down and deploy those 100 buses in different places in Europe. Um, and then even further afield, uh, we just signed an agreement to supply five electrolyzers for transportation-based projects in Australia. We've just opened a, a company in Australia as well, um, and they're looking at hydrogen as, as a key way to decarbonize, decarbonize transport. Um, yeah. I was going to say last so, week, I, know, just, here, uh, I told everybody last week that uh, um, Australia had just released their strategic uh, hydrogen plan. And um, so, yeah, we know they're stepping forward, too, in a, in a big way. I did have a question, though, that, that I was thinking about while you were talking, and that is here in the U.S. we have um, ZEV states, zero emission vehicle states, and that really makes a big difference in terms of getting the, um, the manufacturers to deliver their cars. That's why California has, has virtually everything. They have the Hyundais, they have the Toyotas, yeah. they have the um, Honda, Cl Honda Clarities. Um, so... Does Europe have a similar system for incentivizing um, OEMs to bring um, their their hydrogen vehicles or their electric vehicles um, to offset yeah, they the other? Do. Okay. Yeah. So it, it's country specific, um, but there are uh, clean vehicle incentives um, like rebates and tax breaks for um, OEMs to bring uh, low carbon vehicles into a specific region. Um, and, you know, the main difference with hydrogen uh, transportation rather than battery electric transportation is that 
it really needs to be a much more coordinated effort because of the fact that hydrogen requires a dedicated infrastructure and it can't rely on an existing infrastructure like the electric grid and battery vehicles. Um, so, you know, the two go hand in hand in, in most European places, uh, vehicle incentives and uh, infrastructure incentives. Yeah. Yeah, I just talked to a, f a f friend of mine that um, works in the National Guard and she just got her Tesla and she's really, really happy with it. Um, but she's plugging it into her 110 volt system at home and that really doesn't charge the battery very well even overnight it's it's not enough to charge the battery so she's going to upgrade her system to 220 volt which is what europe uses to get a little faster charge but what we're finding as a shortfall here is that because we're only 110 for the most part in uh, in our buildings that even upgrading to fast charging equipment is causing us to invest a lot more into infrastructure whereas i think over in europe you could probably do pretty reasonable charging at home without a whole lot of utility upgrades, um, even in your house to get a, a decent charge overnight, let alone putting in fast charging stations. But um, I, I think we're, we've got more of an incentive here to go to hydrogen uh, because I don't know how our infrastructure could be upgraded enough to, um, to accommodate quick chargers for all the electric vehicles people are thinking are gonna come online. Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a combination of both. You know, there are some circumstances when electric vehicles are great um, and, you know, they, they should definitely be used because um, they're very good at what they do. But there are a, a whole bunch of other transportation areas where, you know, batteries are just not non-optimal. You know, heavy-duty stuff um, where the battery starts to impact on the payload weight of the vehicle. Um, long ranges, you know, battery vehicles are very limited in terms of range, particularly when they get to be larger, heavier vehicles. And also charge time, you know, the the, um, the fast chargers that are being put into California, you know, they still require, you know, a 30, 45 minute rest period where you have to wait for the vehicle to charge. Um, and, you know, in, in quite a few circumstances, it's just not really that practical. So. You know the benefits of hydrogen, as you know. You know, five minutes and you're back. You're back on the road. Um, uh, but I think more than that, from an energy point of view, um, when the uh, electricity networks start to think about charging, you know, hundreds of thousands of battery vehicles at random times throughout the day, um, it's going to start to cause issues on the grid. And, and having electrolyzers that are, you know, essentially a few thousand vehicles that are plugged in and never move, uh, always available to accept electrons, um, you know, will really help the future electricity grids uh, while still providing zero emission fuel for electric vehicles, albeit fuel cell electric. Yeah, that's true. Well, let's get to your neighborhood now in California, your current neighborhood, and what's new in California? Yeah, so California um, is currently uh, just reached about the 60 station mark in terms of vehicle stations that are either built or, or being built. And um, we have just received the first draft of a new solicitation from the California Energy Commission, which is looking to put up to $110 million for the next wave of stations. Now, what's different this time around is that rather than just putting up a figure and having everybody fight over the money for, you know, one, two, five stations, what they're looking to do this time around is actually be a bit more strategic and, and allow companies to to bid multi-year uh, what they're calling tranches of stations. So, you know, a single company might bid 20, 30 stations over the period of five years. Um, and what that enables us all to do is to try and get that cost down by bulk purchasing and um, also allowing the engineering services and, and construction teams to, to get a bit of economy of scale as well. Um, and so, as I said, it's, it's at draft stage at the moment, so we're all looking at it and, and providing comments. But that's really exciting from the Energy uh, Commission uh, to, to push forward the, the new goal of 200 hydrogen stations, which is what the, the Californians want to put in place. Um, so that's kind of California from the vehicle side of things, from the passenger vehicle side of things. There are also a couple of really exciting heavy-duty projects. Um, Orange County are just about to receive 10 fuel cell buses. Um, 
Palm Springs are, are going to uh, also receive some new fuel cell buses at Sunline Transit. And also down at the Port of LA, Toyota are putting in place 10 Class 8 heavy-duty uh, drage trucks to move goods in and out of the Port of, uh, of LA and into the Inland Empire. So, you know, there were some really exciting heavy-duty projects um, coming online too. Um, you know, which is which is really good for uh, for California. Is is ITM looking outside of California to neighboring states? Because um, you know, I had Keith Malone from the California Fuel Cell Partnership on a couple of shows ago, and and I noticed that California is building some near the borders, especially along uh, Nevada. And um, it seems to me that it would make sense, especially if you wanted to be a destination um, for fuel yeah. cell vehicles, that you start looking at those states expanded. Is ITM doing that? Yeah, that we're looking at different locations as well. You mentioned Vegas as being a destination station, so looking at uh, stations along that border um, and also into into Las Vegas. The other place that we're looking at at the moment is the, is the Oregon region. So there's a new um, organization called the Renewable Hydrogen Alliance, uh, which has started out of Oregon. We're one of the founding members of that uh, alliance. And that's looking to try and develop hydrogen technology um, up that west coast, you know, right the way through uh, Oregon, Washington, and up towards um, uh, Vancouver. And Vancouver is another area that we are currently doing a project. So we have a, uh, a government-funded um, feasibility study looking at up to 300 megawatts of electrolysis based in the Vancouver region to provide hydrogen locally, to provide hydrogen for California, and also some export opportunities to move hydrogen across to Japan as well. Wow. So there's, a lot, there's a lot going on on the, on the, on the west coast uh, of the U.S. for sure. All right. Okay, well, we've, believe it or not, we've hit our 30-minute uh, point on the show. And, uh, man, it seems like we just got started talking about California and the, and the west coast. But, yeah, we'll close up by saying, you know, we, we were aware of uh, some of the things going on in Canada where they're exporting ammonia, which is kind of hydrogen-rich uh, a hydrogen rich liquid that can be moved at uh, ambient temperature ambient pressure which is a nice way to move it and they're they're shipping a lot of that ammonia to to japan and asia mm -hmm. to use in the hydrogen market but hey Stephen, i want to thank you again for being on the show today and getting us up to date and we'll have to bring you in again in another few months and and get another update but thanks for uh, talking with us today and, and bringing some news from uh, europe over to uh, the islands here thanks again yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me. I uh, look forward to coming on again soon. All right. Well, that'll do it for this week on Stand Energy Man, and looking forward to next week and uh, talking some more with you. Aloha till then.